you know, after we sell out, I come into the office and I take one of the customer service calls and it's, you know, this woman who's like, hey, listen, like, actually, I did not get what was promised to me and I got something very, very different. And if you don't correct this, I'm going to sue you. And like, I'm going to get all your customers. We're going to file a class action. Hey everyone, you're tuning in to the Founder Hour. I'm your co-host, Pat, and before we get on with today's show, we just wanted to thank each and every one of you for tuning in week after week and making TFH a top 150 podcast in the careers category on iTunes. For episode 39, Pasha and I hung out with the ultimate brother duo, Daniel and Michael Brukim, co-founders of FabFitFun. FabFitFun is a quarterly subscription box that covers just about everything from beauty to fashion to fitness and sends full-size products to its members instead of just samples. Before the Brukims launched FabFitFun, they both graduated from law school, but neither planned on practicing law. They instead partnered together and started a digital agency with some friends from college, and eventually began working with political candidates such as Rudy Giuliani, all the way to Hollywood icons like Rachel Zoe and Juliana Ranzik. Tune in as we talk about how the idea for FabFitFun came about, the early challenges and struggles they faced getting the company off the ground, the two's relationship as brothers and co-founders, and what drives happiness for them both. We also talk about the future of FabFitFun and the effect that consumer adoption of new brands has on their business. And also, if you want to give FabFitFun a try, use our special code FOUNDER for $10 off your first box. Here we go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Founder Hour podcast. This is your co-host, Posh, and we're here also with Pat and the brother duo of Daniel and Michael Brukim of FabFitFun. And we are so excited to have you know you guys on our show, but also we're so excited that you welcomed us to your offices here uh, to do this interview and uh, have this conversation with us. So uh, I just want to kick it off with the fact that Eitan Albaz, who was a former guest on our show, uh, was the one that introduced us to you guys. So I want to ask how you guys knew him. Um, yeah, I mean, I so this is Michael speaking. By the way, our voice is pretty similar, and I think this is actually <laughs> our first joint uh, podcast. So awesome. Uh, you know, we, we have mind meld, and now we have voice meld. Uh, Aton, um, I think it's hard not to know Aton if you're in LA and you're an entrepreneur. I think you know it's a very small community here. Um, I can't actually think of the specific person that introduced me, Danny might remember who introduced him. Um, but, uh, you know, ever since Aton let me borrow his Burning Man, you know, gear five or six years ago, uh, he's been a sort of, you know, trusted friend and advisor and an, an investor in FabFitFun. Mm-hmm. And we're really grateful for, you know, his relationship and and, and help over the years. And, and this is Dan chiming in. Uh, Aton's a very close friend. And I have to say, uh, he's sort of like a fixture in the LA tech community. And when we were first going, uh, you know, I was like, oh, who's, you know, you hear of Aton, you hear of his brother Gil and mm-hmm. like the Elbaz brothers. And, uh, you know, one of the two like people who sort of reached out and embraced us really, really early on. And like, you know, he was having dinner with me before like FabFitFun. Yeah, you know, we even launched our boxes and sort of giving advice and feedback. And, uh, you know, when we raised money, he was like one of the first people in line to say, I'm going to invest in your company. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, we love those guys and uh, super thankful to have that relationship and glad that he connected us to you guys as well. Yeah, likewise. And Eton, if you're listening, thank you again for connecting us. And people love that episode just because I don't think they had necessarily heard of Eton unless they were in the tech scene. But hearing his story and, you know, what he's built, I mean, how many things he's built up, up to this point was just obviously very impressive. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you guys, uh, where were you raised? Where were you born and raised? Were you guys always so- in L.A.? Yeah, so we were uh, born and raised in L.A. We grew up in a combination of uh, the Valley and Westwood because our parents moved around a little bit as we were growing up. And we went to uh, high school in Sherman Oaks at a school called uh, the Buckley School. It's a small private school. Uh, but I guess technically, if you're asking where we were literally born, it was in Tarzana Hospital. Same here. Yeah, that's where he was born. <laughs> oh, oh, very cool. <laughs> cool. So um, like growing up, like what was kind of like, do you guys, did you guys have like a vision of like what you wanted to be when you grew up or was it kind of just, you know, we'll go to college because it's a thing to do and we'll figure it out then? I, I wanted to be a point guard for the, the Lakers. We all did. Um, so that was definitely the dream and, uh, you know, it's, you know, sadly lapsed at this point. Um, beyond that, I, you know, at least for for myself, I this is Michael again. I, I'm gonna stop identifying myself. Good luck, listener. Uh, I um, 
I, I didn't know. I, I definitely didn't even have a concept of like entrepreneurship being um, a sort of discrete thing that you could do or, you know, um, but I, you know, also definitely didn't have a, a vision of being in some sort of corporate work. I think, you know, if you think of LA, I think of it as the sort of creative capital of the world. A lot of people are entrepreneurial um, in the sense of even, you know, Hollywood is, uh, you know, people with scripts and trying to make movies, and that's a very ultra entrepreneurial culture. We grew up. Our dad's a doctor, and he also became sort of very entrepreneurial within his um, within his field. And so, I think that was sort of in the ether and around us. The, the Persian Jewish community also, is, you know, puts a very high value on sort of going out there and starting things and doing things. And so, um, you know, I, 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 did, I, you know, I think at some point I, I thought maybe I'll be like a public intellectual. I didn't really know what that meant, other than like. You get to write and share thoughts and things, but um, to the extent that I am, it's only on podcasts like this at this point. <laughs> uh, for me, I, I think I also shared ambitions of playing in the NBA one day, and unfortunately, those were quickly squashed. Pro- probably around the time I hit the fifth or sixth grade, I you know went to basketball camp at UCLA and realized some of those kids were really much, much, much better than me. And I was like, I don't, you know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. So, uh, you know, sort of echoing some of Mike's sentiments, like being uh, Persian, Jewish in L.A., like you don't really run into too many people who actually work for someone else. So, like, I always had this notion that I like I couldn't have really fathomed working for anyone else. And like our role models growing up, you know, my father, you know, who is, you know, our number one role model is a doctor, but also, you know, sort of became an entrepreneur uh, later in life. And so that was one example. And my uncles were very, very similar running their own business. So uh, when you look at them and then you start extending beyond that, you see so many successful like Persian business entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, working for yourself was sort of just like a given Mm -hmm. at some point in time. Um, Yeah. And, you know, Michael, you brought it up about, you know, being, you know, Persian Jewish and having, you know, I know that you guys had immigrant parents, both Pat and I also had immigrant parents. Pat's came from, I think, Iran, right? And mine came from Lebanon. So, you know, we were always kind of brought up with the stories of what their past was like. And it wasn't it wasn't great, obviously. Um, How has that impacted the both of you being the children of immigrant parents? Yeah, I think, you know, we were deeply rooted in a community here in LA. Um, So I think we're, you know, sort of part of that and sort of, you know, grew out of that and grew, grew, were raised by that, you know, in the sense of like, it takes a village. I think the Persian Jews in in LA really, really feel that way. Um, You know, my, my parents uh, came here during the Iranian revolution in, in the late seventies. And I, I think another thing that, you know, you, we just never, you never take much for granted. Um, I think that was sort of a thing that was just drilled into us throughout growing up is, you know, things can change. Um, and, you know, my my mom, for example, grew up in an extraordinarily wealthy family and they, you know, sort of had to leave everything behind and, and, and sort of start over in some, you know, real big sense. And my dad too. And I think, so that idea of being self-reliant um, and yeah, not, 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 you know, sort of, you know, not taking things for granted, take, dotting your I's, crossing your T's. Um, but then also I think that, I think a thing that's really lovely about um, our community is uh, we all sort of very much support each other. I think there's a really strong sense of, um, you know, you have something to fall back on. Uh, I think so many, I'm, you know, I'm so proud of just the accomplishments of, of some of my friends. And, um, you know, we've traded notes all the time with, uh, you know, if you just list off the companies, everything from, Fashion Nova and MeUndies and Sweetgreen and uh, Tinder and, you know, so on and so forth. There's so many of these sort of, uh, you know, consumer successes have been built out of L.A. by Persian Jewish entrepreneurs. And, you know, we're all meeting each other, trading notes, sharing stories and things like that. So I think it's been hugely, hugely helpful and, you know, really grateful for that. Yeah, like uh, like Pasha said, like my parents uh, were, you know, immigrants too and, and coming from Iran, like, like you know, with, with the revolution and everything, it was kind of like, uh, I'm sure it's the same way for your parents is, they can come and take strip you away of everything at any given moment. And so like it was, you know, it was always like go to college, make sure you go to college and get your degree, um, you know, and like entrepreneurship wasn't like taught so much. It was kind of like, yeah, you know, you go get your degree, you work hard, and then maybe like when you're older, you can like run a business. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure Daniel will have a lot more to say on this too, but um, – we both are. We both got our law degrees. Yeah, um, I was, that was my gonna be like. Yeah. yeah, that was my segue. I was like, <laughs> seemingly for for not not you know not any concrete. Reasons. Well, I think one of the one of the things that you know sort of uh, 
having immigrant parents who sort of had to flee their country, there was that overemphasis on like get your education, you know, uh, learn so that like no matter what happens in life, you can sort of land on your feet and do something productive. So that was definitely something that was like sort of beaten uh, into us pretty early on. And as Mike mentioned, we you know did both go to law school, and so uh, and then you know quickly sort of set aside our law degrees to go <laughs> <laughs> pursue our own endeavors. But once we had that law degree, you know our, our parents, you know if you right. talk to my dad, the way he introduces it, like hey, my sons are lawyers, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I'm like, even even yeah, today. literally he's like lawyer, and I'm like, you know, dad, like I never practiced law. <laughs> Mike never practiced law. You know, we actually, you know, we, we have a company. It's doing pretty well these days. <laughs> like, you know, we've done, you know, the, the and we don't, do, us, we don't you know? do our own yeah. legal here. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's like we have an like, amazing yeah, general we have the, very grateful. You know, we have, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have like other companies we're involved with. We've done all these things, you know, and not, not so hopefully mu much more to come. But like yeah, at yeah. least, you know, we, we don't view ourselves as lawyers anymore. But for them, you know, that's like the big accomplishment in our lives right. is the fact that, <laughs> We have the law degree and like, you know, uh, they think that's like the most valuable thing in the world. And the reason why we're successful or uh, done well so far to date is because, you know, we went to law school. <laughs> and, I, and I personally find this rather comical and refreshing because I am the same way. I, I was telling uh, Daniel before we started that I went to law school as well after uh, after USC. And I quickly realized that I don't want to be a lawyer like my first week of law school. Um, and so obviously it's difficult kind of to figure out what you want to do after, but again, it was the same thing with my parents. It's like, Posh, you just got to finish it. Like, you know, you just, you started, just finish it. Like do whatever you want to do after just, just finish the damn thing. Like, you know, to lean on it or, you know, like yeah. my, my grandpa says like, it's like, you know, it's like another bracelet that's on your arm. Like you'd always lean back on that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. I actually have a, a funny st yeah, story yeah. for you to say, uh, for, um, for me to tell you guys, yeah. which is my first day of law school. I go to orientation. And like my parents are obviously very excited, they're very sensitive about, very excited about the fact that I'm going to law school. But I, you know, I decided to pull a prank on them. I call my mom and I'm like, "Listen, mom, like I just, I know this is not for me. I can't do this. I'm dropping out. I'm just not going to do it." And uh, you know, apparent, apparently she started called my dad and told him what's going on, and like they didn't get the joke for some reason, and uh, which surprised me because I'd been pulling pranks on my parents throughout the course of my entire yeah, life. Yeah. All the time, and they, you know, they started getting very upset with each other. And my dad's like, "It's because you spoiled him." And like, <laughs> she's like, "He's like, you should have put a TV in his room growing up. Look now, what's he gonna do? He's not gonna his law degree, and like so on and so forth." Yeah, it sounds like a Middle Eastern family. <laughs> yeah, it, it's sort of like a Middle Eastern family, and you know, uh, it's just like she goes to show you how much they really wanted us to get those mm -hmm. degrees. And I know, I mean, so Daniel, you went to UCLA Law, Michael, you went to Stanford, and I mean, you had gone to Harvard before, so you guys were very well educated, obviously, but at what point, you know, in law school, did you both realize that this isn't what we want to do, and we know what we want to do, but, or we maybe we don't know what we want to do? Uh, it, I think that the, you know, the road to where we are uh, had a, was very windy. Yeah. Um, in some ways, actually, uh, you know, I, so I spent three years outside of school before I went to law school. Um, after college, and in some ways, I sort of like handed a baton to Dan, um, and you know, then while I was in school, he was sort of c continued the journey of what eventually, you know, became what is Fab to Fun today. Um, and so I think, uh, I, I, I think both of us actually were in law school, and the entire time we were in law school, probably didn't think we were going to practice law. Um, I, you know, I, I, I started a JD MBA. I ended up dropping out of business school. Um, because I actually wanted to spend more time on business. <laughs> it was very ironic, but uh, business school actually requires attendance, law school uh, less so. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, I, I don't think there was a, a, a moment per se, and I think Danny, you know, pretty, you know, he can speak for himself too, but I think pretty early in his law school career, uh, you know, he had internships that were non-legal and was doing things that were, you know, you know, and I, after I graduated and Mike was going to law school, I told him not to go. <laughs> I said, do not do this. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he, he rarely, if ever, listens to me. So yeah. what are you going to do? And I tell people that yeah. all the time and they never listen to me. So yeah. if they're listening to this podcast, now you have two people that have told you. Well, no, no. So. I, and I don't want to be poo-pooing the law because there's many uh, friends of mine who are great lawyers and have wonderful yeah. careers and enjoy it. I just think that what happens is a lot of times that people who go to law school don't necessarily want to be lawyers. And I think that's a bad reason to go. If you're going to go, it's because you really love the law, you're engaged by the intellectual challenge of it, and it's sort of where you see your career evolving. But if you want to be an entrepreneur, I don't recommend going to law school. 
So you guys go to law school and you graduate and you come out and what do you do? I, well, so I'll, yeah. Oh. We can re rewind a little bit, I guess, is, is because we, so we were at law school at different times. It wasn't even, yeah. it, it was, um, when, so I started a, a digital agency with a, a couple friends of mine in college. Mm, okay. This um, is undergrad? This in, is undergrad, oh, okay. my senior year. Got it. Um, and we were initially doing a lot of political new media consulting, uh, and eventually that evolved, you know, someone told me politics and Hollywood are basically the same thing. And I want to spend more time in LA. I was in Boston, New York at the time. So when I ended up in LA, um, that's when I started, you know, working with sort of more of the celebrity world. Um, it was around that time that Danny was graduating law school. Um, we had started FabFitFun within the agency as a side project initially as a media business. Um, and, you know, it was actually, Danny was, you know, just graduating, was, you know, thinking about what's next. And I said, Dan, just come. There's a lot of stuff going here. And I'm starting in the fall. Um, and so, uh, you know, at that point, uh, Dan, you know, Dan jumped in. I went away. Um, and I don't know if you want to. You know, oh, keep, yeah. Keep so so we, you know, sort of came into to the agency and started running that. And as Mike had mentioned, uh, you know, we were taking on a project uh, called Fat Fit Fun at the time, which we turned into a newsletter and a blog, uh, ran that as a newsletter and blog while also uh, working on the agency business and also doing some angel investing on the side. And uh, after some time, uh, you know, was looking at Fat Fit Fun and we had developed a nice audience, uh, some great content and had built, you know, what was the small notions of a brand, but, you know, we, we looked at the writing on the wall. We saw uh, you know, what had happened to some other newsletter businesses like Daily Candy and Thrillist and a lot of them that had become successful had evolved into e-commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in spring of 13, we launched our uh, membership business where you get a box of full-size products four times a year. You get access to a slew of other goods and services. And we sort of said, let's take what we have with Fabit Fun and sort of turn it into something else and see if we can make something much, much bigger and much more mm -hmm. special out of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we launched the boxes in spring of 2013, and then since then it's been sort of off to the off to the races. Uh, you know, very fortunate to have you know sold out of the first 2,000 boxes within the first 48 hours, and um, you know had a vision for how we could build something from there. And I definitely want to delve into Fat Fit Fun even more, but I know that when you had started this digital agency, um, I had seen somewhere that it was you were working with political clients. And I read something that was like this rather famous guy who's actually pretty famous now too for you know some things that he's doing in the news it was Rudy Giuliani. So how did that come about? Uh, yeah, so I was my senior year in college. And this is Michael, by the way. This is Michael speaking <laughs> now. And I was writing my thesis uh, in the library and one of my you know best friends said, look, I've, I've become friends with uh, this sort of uh, you know political guy who's now starting to work with Rudy and Rudy was deciding to run for president and Rudy needs a website. And, you know, he said, you know, Mike, you've, you've done some work at the Crimson. I was the editorial chair of the, the Crimson done, built some sort of helped a lot with the sort of the community and blogs and forums and things like that mm -hmm. at the Crimson. And, you know, do you want to help me out with it? And, you know, started as sort of just a side project. I actually already accepted a different job to work at Disney. Um, but then, you know, that sort of grew from one thing to another. And then, we found that in building websites, uh, they would pay us to do that, and that became exciting and lucrative. And you know, soon we we had established uh, you know an agency with more. You know, Rudy was our first client, and um, picked up other gubernatorial mm -hmm. candidates and senate candidates. Um, and really, at the time, you know, it sounds like you know why would they hire sort of two kids out of Harvard to do things like this? Um, but if you think of you know the time of oh six oh seven, sort of that time period. There was no such thing as an expert in digital strategy or digital media in politics. It didn't exist, right? This is, you know, this is when Twitter this is like pre Jared. Kushner. This is when tw yeah, this is pre Jared Kushner. Um, this, this is you know, Twitter had just launched, right? Yeah. F Facebook was a couple of years old, um, and so but campaign, you know, the Howard Dean campaign was the most innovative thing in '04. This is you know, and so there was nothing. But people said, oh, but this is a new medium. We need to do something. So really hiring young people was sort of a, a smart idea. Um, we built a lot of things. A lot of it didn't get launched, but I, that was a school of hard knocks for me. Um, learned how to build a website, learned um, how to manage a team. Um, and, you know, that, that translated really well because, uh, you know, actually a lot of the similar skills uh, about, you know, the, the, when I said politics and Hollywood are basically the same thing, we were taking personalities 
right? And building sort of websites around those personalities and finding ways to uh, build audiences. And in politics especially, there was this idea of building an email list or building a database um, and then eventually trying to monetize that database by getting donations. Um, it's not so dissimilar from the types of things that you do in any sort of performance marketing or direct response type of business. So the agency started, did it start with that project? For, for real, yeah. Pl- yeah, okay. And then um, how did you like decide what other projects you're taking on? Was it just kind of anything that came your way? Like did it have to be political or was it just- No, yeah. So, so because that itself was so opportunistic, it was just exciting. We yeah. were, you know, two kids. Yeah. Three kids. I can imagine. And, you know, we had, it was a few of us, <laughs> different people coming in and out. Um, at different points, that um, we, you know, everything was sort of opportunistic. And we looked at everything as sort of, if this is exciting and we think, you know, it makes sense and it's, a, you know, either going to be like a great learning experience or potentially lucrative or, you know, we'll build some skills or, you know, build our network or whatever. We were just sort of all ears and we would take, you know, we'd fly anywhere, listen to anyone. We're very, very hungry at that point. Um, and so, you know, that we... We, we picked up the other candidates and then when we, you know, that happened to translate really well. And at some point, um, we also knew at that point we were going to build internal projects. Uh-huh. So we built uh, the first thing uh, or one of the one of the projects was actually uh, it was called Totspot, which is like a social network for babies. Okay. And so we, we knew uh-huh. we didn't want to always be an agency. We wanted to build asset value, enterprise value. So we take sort of some of the resources and cash and sort of team that we were building and say, what else can we build? Um, Totspot ended up being. Um, you know, got a lot of attention. It was in TechCrunch, and Mike Arrington wrote posts about it. It was in the New York Times. You know, this is a time when that's like, yeah. you know, that you're, you're, if you, you feel like crunch, on top like of the world, yeah. right? And so we, we, you know, when we got that attention, we got a call from um, the folks at MySpace who were interested in meeting with us and and learning more about what we were doing and you know talking about an acquisition and different things like that. And we ended up didn't didn't do a deal with them, but that's who sort of entered us into the world of Hollywood and. Um, you know, the first person we met from there was Rachel Zoe. Mm-hmm. That became our first celebrity client. And uh, we helped her sort of uh, figure out what eventually became the Zoe Report and Zoe Media Group, which is, you know, uh, you know great sort of fashion property today. Um, and that put us in the map in L.A. We then picked up clients like Dick Clark Productions. Um, we worked with Samuel Jackson. We worked with Tumblr. Um, so you work with like the Golden Globes and the we worked AMAs. with the Golden Globes, yeah. the American Music Awards, and and every you know I think we 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 had this sort of um, you know, we felt like we if we didn't know how to do something we'd figure it out yeah and so we quickly developed a lot of skills um, and then if we didn't have the right people we'd go find those people to help us learn and and execute on those projects um, and that was honestly you know those three years were were like. The biggest education, and you know, one of, one of my clients at the time, also um, where I ended up spending a lot more time, actually a year during law school, was a company called Beachmint. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was also sort of the school of hard knocks of e-commerce, right? Where I learned the ins and outs of um, subscription commerce and 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 you know, working with celebrities in the in, in with actually physical product. Yeah. Um, so a lot of those lessons have stuck, and I think become part of the DNA of what we've what we've done here at FabFitFun. So uh, how did the idea for FabFitFun come about um, throughout this time? And did it start as one of your in- internal projects? Yeah, so FabFitFun is, and you know, I think the best way to describe it is, is a bundle of ideas that have sort of aggregated on top of each other. Um, the initial, you know, the, the, the initial thing was really, it was we did something great for the Zoe Report and for Rachel Zoe. Um, what else can we do like that? And we had a friend approach us and say, you know, I, I'm I'm working with uh, uh, Juliana Rancic, and you know, you know, would you want to be part of it? And so we 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 said sure, and we looked at that, and we started basically what became sort of her lifestyle blog. Um, and you know, different things happened. Different people came in and out of that project, but eventually it became sort of an internal mm-hmm. project, you know, purely within the agency. Um, and then we sort of relaunched it again, um, focused as more of a newsletter. In the spirit of what we had really done with with Rachel Zoe, what we saw was successful with like the Thrillists and Daily Candies of the world. Um, but even at the outset of FabFitFun, there was this idea that you know media itself wasn't going to be enough. I think that was became more and more obvious as you saw sort of um, you know what's what's just purely obvious today, which is 
ad dollars go to Facebook and Google and there's not much left for anyone else, mm -hmm. you know, you know, unless you guys, you know, are very enterprising right. young media moguls <laughs> like yourselves and figuring out new formats like this podcast. Um, but it's hard, right? right it's hard to build a, a, a niche media business. Mm -hmm. And so we tried a few different experiments. We talked to our audience a lot. Um, Dan and I brainstormed together a lot about what could work. And, uh, you know, we, we had, we had other sort of inspirations, things like Beachman, Ipsy, Birchbox were out there, but none of them were doing what we thought was the, what would be the FabFitFun subscription box, mm -hmm. right? Which was, we were focused on a holistic view of the person that was in the DNA of the brand that we had built on day one. Um, we were not just in a vertical, right? It's not just beauty. It's not just fashion, um, but it's a really full view of that person. Right. We wanted to do full-size products. We didn't think it was like sort of not sample size. We didn't, yeah. we didn't think we were trying to solve a problem in an right. industry. Like we weren't trying to solve a beauty industry problem. We were trying to make a customer overjoyed by the experience of receiving right. a package. Right. Um, and so, and then when we thought about full size and we thought about, um, when we thought about full size and, and full lifestyle, we also knew the cadence couldn't be, uh, it, it couldn't be monthly to get to the right sort of value prop and, and yeah. sort of consistency. For, for any like big picture thinker, like, you know, when you're like, you know, thinking of an idea and, and you kind of like want to go all in and kind of look at like the holistic view of it. Um, sometimes, you know, you hear like people say, or even investors say like, focus on one thing and, you know, try to like, ta you know, like own that and then expand out. But you, you decided to just like from the beginning, just like go all in on like every aspect of, of people's lives. Well, so I think there's so many, so many parts of that question. Yeah. One in the agency, we were very opportunistic. So we were doing a lot of different things, yeah. right? And so there was a there's definitely periods of exploration, I'd say in, in you know my life, my career, I think, I think Danny's as well. And then times of extreme focus, right? When when we actually in some sense the box seemed unfocused to some people, right? They were they they looked at that and said, you know, I don't get it. It's it's a random box, right? It's not a beauty box, it's not a fashion box, it's not a fitness box. And that was a lot of the feedback we got from the investment community. It's like it just feels random. But you know, our conviction was that's a very focused effort at trying to recreate almost like Christmas, right? <laughs> well, a lot of it was driven by this notion of sort of replicating the VIP swag bag as well. Right. So, you know, part of the things that we were looking at when we launched the boxes were we'd go to media events, we'd get swag bags, and we thought to ourselves, why not take that experience and sort of consumerize it? So that was one thing. There's also this Japanese concept called fukubukuru where you get a closeout bag at the end of every single season uh, where like it's sort of like a mystery thing. And it's very, very, very popular in Japan. And there's a company in uh, LA that was sort of trying to emulate that. And so we thought to ourselves, like take this concept of sort of fukubukuru, like these closeout mystery bags, but like, uh, and sort of this VIP swag bags and marry them together uh, and, you know, sort of make them a consumer value prop. Uh, and so I think those two ideas together were sort of a lot of the driving sort of inspiration and force behind us doing that, the, the FabFitFun box. So it wasn't that we were trying to be intentionally broad. It was that the thing that we're trying to emulate were, were broad to begin with. Yeah. And, and I think to, to the question of focus, I, I think it's almost like an organized mess, right? Sometimes you look at someone's desk and there's piles of paper everywhere and you'd be like, this person's really disorganized, right? And then if someone comes and moves and puts in one stack, it looks more organized. But to that person it's now a mess, yeah. right? And so I, I think Dan and I had a pretty clear sense of what we were doing that was different and focused and, mm -hmm. and sort of proven even with our audience, right? We actually, we, actually, we actually did surveys and things like that to test the concept with our audience. Um, and so we had good, good, a good feeling about it. Um, and, and then when we launched it, it was, you know, where, where there's smoke, there's fire. We ended up getting that early traction and, you know, I think then it was really, really hard to, to take us off that, right? No matter who would tell us, like, this is a bad idea or something like that, we'd be like, no, we're making people happy. <laughs> They're excited. Mm -hmm. We're delivering a lot of value. We're going to keep leading into it. And so I think, I, I think you know, the, the biggest lesson in terms of focus, you know, for me is, is really focusing on the customer, yeah. right? And then letting that be sort of your North Star. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. like this level of like, there's like, you know, you can go by what's like being preached and what the right way to quote unquote right way to do, you know, go about starting a business is. But then there's also like when you know, you know, and like you said, you tested it out, you saw that you saw that, you know, positive response. 
and you just knew that that was the way to go and you just went through went with it right yeah, yeah i mean <laughs> I, yeah I, th I think the i, I think you're not going to get you know there's there's this idea i think uh peter Thiel has which is like great businesses are secrets right they, they, they're sort of like the, the unique insights that you have and so you're not going to get that really by sort of asking other people right you know you, you can get feedback and you can get sort of spot sort of, it's not, not to be obtuse about it, right? You should, you should listen, there's wisdom out there about how to execute on this or that or whatever better. But then if you're gonna build a successful business, it, by definition, you're doing something unique, mm -hmm. right? Like that's what it is to be an entrepreneur is to do something that other people haven't done. And so I think, I think that, that was, that we had our own conviction in something. Mm -hmm. And I think that was sort of the, the unique set of properties about what made our box different in, in what, you know, felt like at the time and, you know, and, you know, even D Dan and I at different points felt better. i would be totally honest. I give Danny a lot of credit. I think, you know, early on I was really excited. And then I think when, when it came down to launch, I was like, we we missed the boat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there were so many boxes. And I, I lost confidence at some right. point too. Right. And I think, um, you know, part of the amazing dynamic that we've had is, is, you know, when one's one place, the other person sort of pulls you right. up. I don't know if you guys have experienced yeah. that. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about next was, so you had said that while you were at your senior year of Harvard kind of launched, you know, it was called, was it called Charlie or was that something else? So before Charlie, there was Opera New Media. Okay. When, when we were doing politics. And then when we went to, to Hollywood, we renamed to Charlie. Got you. And, and Danny, were you involved at this time? Yeah. I, I came in before Charlie was launched. And so uh, when I got involved, we sort of took the amalgamation of work and thought, let's brand ourselves in a different way. Uh, and because we were foraying into new media uh, and not so much politics, but mm -hmm. like new media in the Hollywood sense, we sort of thought, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Chaplin was a foremost figure in uh, the uh, sort of evolution of media. And we thought like name it after him. And also it so happened that the, we had, you know, three other co-founders at the time. Uh, this guy, Adam Katz, who's in New York and Sam Teller, who's, uh, you know, now chief of staff for Elon Musk is, is super talented guys. You know, uh, they and my brother had all gone to Harvard together. So there was also the Charles River. So we have two stories of, you know, uh, what was the initial naming origin mm -hmm. for Charlie. But we all came together, uh, launched uh, Charlie and took sort of opera and evolved what they had into what was Charlie. Right. And that sort of predated FabFitFun. When you guys were kids, were, were you ever, I mean, were you guys close as brothers when you were growing up? I, we were as close as two people could. I, I think the relationship that Danny and I have together is a, the one of the most unique you know, relationships you can How many have. years apart are you guys? We're 13 curious. months apart. 13 months? Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. one, year. one year, one month, 10 days. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't mean we, we, we never fight. I'd actually say we, we usually fight in some sense, right? Like, but it's not, like we grew up having, you know, our, our you know, our, our one-on-one -on -one basketball battles that, you know, Dan would often win because he was bigger than me. And, and one year makes a big difference better. at that age. And, and things bigger, like that. Bigger, better, stronger, better. Yeah. Whatever you want to call but it. We learned, <laughs> but, we learned, but we learned, you know, I think there's, you know, of all the things that our parents taught us, I think the, the fact, you know, we, we, we only have one sibling and, you know, how special that can be. Um, and I think, you know, I, I at least had some notion growing up that, um, I actually didn't think I necessarily would be doing business, but I always thought, I think Danny's going to be doing business. And one way or another, like, you know, we're going to find ways to mm -hmm. do stuff together. Yeah. Um, so, I th you know, I think that was, um, you know, from an early age. And I think uh, it's, yeah, it, it's been, it's, it's not even, we're not even twins, right? We're, we're, right. we're but it's, so it's its own little thing. It's, it's, there's so much in that. You're almost like what? What I think it's called like it's Irish called twins. Irish, or yeah, we're, yeah, we're Irish twins. Yeah, yeah, we're forty forty one days away from being Irish. Right. Twins. Yeah. <laughs> um. So how how do you separate, or maybe you don't, but how do you separate, you know, brotherhood from you know co-founder, co-CEO of you know FabFitFun? I, I I'm not sure that you always totally do. In in some ways that could be good, and in some ways that can be bad. Like we, you know. Uh, we have a lot more tolerance for mistakes because you are brothers and things like that. But in the same way, we can be each other's harshest critics because, you know, we, we have that level of comfort. So um, <laughs> it's it's hard to disentangle that relationship. I think the one thing we we try to do is is how we communicate, right? Um, 
is where we sort of want to break, you know, sort of those like historical patterns of how you communicate as brothers that don't necessarily translate to the workplace, mm -hmm. right? But like in terms of, uh, you know, care and compassion and things like that, like you almost have like a deeper level of sensitivity because you're brothers and co-founders and I'm sure other co-founders have that, but like you're sort of like, it's a marriage at some level, but like it's now a deeper, deeper right. marriage because you're family. So in a lot of ways, I think um, having that, closeness and familiarity and a lot of people say like you index for things like uh different skill sets when you're looking for a co-founder or things like that but i've recently read literature that says actually what you want to index for is like the strength and longevity of the relationship because no matter what's going to happen like you're going to have ups and downs in your business relationship you're going to have ups and downs in your business all these types of things but if you have a long-standing common bond uh you know sort of like history of working together, these types of things, you can survive the ups and downs, mm -hmm. which are inevitable, inevitably right. going to happen. Right. Yeah, and what, the thing I'd add is, I, I think um, I, I think it's evolved, right? Which is early on, in any time you're starting a company, the idea of work-life balance, I think, is just a myth. Um, there's no such thing as work-life balance. It's just there's work, right? And so like our, our for at least the first few years of really you know, both the, the part of the you know, few first few years was, which was part of it was wandering the desert and then eventually was like finding the oasis, but then like building, building that initial, you know, team and scale and all that stuff. I think through all that period, I think it was really, really hard to find me and Danny not talking about business mm -hmm. at almost any given point. It was just really, really hard. I mean, we'd still do things, you know, with our, you know, family and I'd, I'd give it, to, you know, shout out to our family and our friends who've been there for us throughout to help us sometimes disengage, right? But I think especially over the last year, maybe even a little bit more than that, as we've been able to just put our heads above water, at, you know, a bit, we have just the most phenomenal team here, such great, you know, executive talent um, that's really helping us that you can start to actually have a little bit of a life outside of FabFitFun. Um, it was a little tiny, yeah, right? Very little. Uh, very, very <laughs> little. Um, but I think that's helped us. And I think, you know, we've, We've been able to, you know, we've been, and, and I think our, and I think having that allows us to then re-engage, you know, a more pure brother level. And I think our, and I, again, I also just give credit, a lot of credit to our friends and family who sometimes, you know, if we're at the dinner table or at Shabbat or something and we're, we're the guys at the, you know, you know, with the family. Yeah. yeah I, look, they, they pull us out of it. Right. They, <laughs> yeah. they force us. They, they're like, now is not the time. Well, <laughs> Sometimes now that it's exciting, they want to know though. Yeah. So, like, now so we don't want to like, talk about like, it. We don't want to talk yeah, about we're like, it. We're, we're good. seeing each other and they're, you know, they're at the family dinner table. Like what's going on? How many boxes? You know, <laughs> when are you fundraising? How's this going? How's the, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah. So I think it just depends on the situation. Yeah. Um, something that a lot of our listeners always, you know, are curious about is kind of the challenges that founders face, um, you know, kind of in respective to their company, you know, starting their, their companies. Um, I, I know from the beginning you said, uh, you know, it's kind of success right out the gate. No, um, it wasn't actually. I okay. think that, yeah. that that's a, that's that's a sort of a mythology. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we went through, you know, many years of sort of evolving the business and sort of like had a period of struggle before we launched the boxes and sort of the catalyst. Uh, for launching the boxes, I think, in large part, was the fact that we were actually struggling. And so, uh, you know, we realized that the newsletter business that we had launched, you know, while it was good at doing a few things, which was like establishing a brand and getting our name out there, right? Like the, it was the furthest thing from actually a success at that point. And so uh, we, you know, actually one of the reasons we launched the boxes in all transparency was we needed to generate some cash. You know, and we like that idea. So uh, we're like, we we need to uh, make money. Uh, you know, selling ads is really tough in this climate. Like the newsletter business is on a decline, and you know, we knew that we didn't want to go into the agency business because the agency business, at the end of the day, is a services business, and a services business, you know, is hard to scale, yeah. right? And so, like, we wanted to build a scalable business that we thought had a lot of long lasting potential. And uh, it, so it's sort of the, the, the what's the uh, necessities, like the, function, the source of innovation, or, or I think there's an expression like that. So it was sort of like, we actually need to generate revenue in order to keep this thing going. And like, we have this audience, what's the type of thing that we think could do that? And part of that was, you know, we obviously thought the boxes were a great idea, but was we actually need cash. Well, and, and even the boxes themselves, like the 
week one was amazing. Yeah. I'd say, you know, month two to eight or nine was nerve wracking. Yeah. Right? Like there was there were, that, that second box did not, you know, sell out over. Well, we had, and we had tons of things that we were, you know, learning. We had, you know, you, you make every mistake you could imagine making everything from, you know, we, 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 we got sunglasses that were the wrong size. They only fit children. And we sent them to, to grown women. <laughs> we, you know, we, we, we forgot to put one product in every single box. You know, I don't know if it's we or the 3PL, but so, you know, someone did at the time. Yeah. Um, and you know, we double shipped boxes one time, right? There's, you know, and so so there was so many times where we were like, you know, looking at each other, and I, I remember t- you our know, fr- our first box. You know, we made a huge error, yeah. uh, and you know, we tell this story often. So we sent out our first box, and uh, we had different versions of the boxes. And what we hadn't realized, unbeknownst to us, was that we had uh, basically created a better version of the box and a worse version of the box. And the the better version of the box is what went out to bloggers who were advertising, and. Uh, the worst version went to a lot of our customers. So we ended up getting a lot of customer complaints and we were looking at the complaints and we're like, what the hell's going on? How'd this happen? And, you know, one of our customers said, you know what, if you guys don't correct this, we're actually going to sue you. And so like even on day one, right, we were getting... That's why I hate lawyers. Yeah, well, it's not (laughs) that we hate lawyers. It's like, look, I actually think in this case, like they were right, right? And so like this was like one of the earliest, uh, sort of earliest influential moments in our company, which was sort of like this pivotal moment where like we really don't have that much cash. You know, we uh, took like our flyer with the boxes and we sold out of the first 2000. So we're, you're riding sky high. And, you know, uh, you know, after we sell out, I come into the office and I take one of the customer service calls and it's, you know, this woman who's like, Hey, listen, like, actually I did not get what was promised to me and I got something very, very different. And if you don't correct this, I'm going to sue you. And like, I'm going to get all your customers. We're going to file a class action. And so, so at you guys that, are like freaking out. Well, we were freaking out, but like, you know, we sort of discussed it and we, you know, to Mike's, Mike, you know, uh, you know, had a lot of consumer experience at the time. And he's like, you know what, we have to fix this now or else like, you know, we're dead in the water. So we had to make really difficult decisions at the time, which was like, you know, we're, we're basically low on cash. We're funding this thing ourselves, you know, uh, you know, living at home at the time I, I was living at home with my parents. And uh, we're like, you know, either we, we sort of address this in a positive way or, you know, who knows what's going to happen. So we decided to give all the customers who complained a free next box. And that was actually a very, very, very painful decision because it was like several hundred customers it's times 50. Yeah, it's a guys. huge loss. And we we're already like sort of scraping by trying to make this happen on, you know, a shoestring budget. And then our second box, you know, one week before, actually, it's an amazing story. One week before our main product is going to come in for our second box. And we were like, at the time, you know, our first box was 2,000 units. Our second box. And where are you guys getting the material from? Well, so let me, so we're reaching out to friends. The first box, actually, <laughs> we got a lot of materials. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I had brought in one of my friends at the time. He was actually also a former lawyer. He came in to help us launch the boxes. And he went to, uh, I, told, I told him his name was Kevin. I said, Kevin, you know, if we can get this product, Moroccan hair oil, in the box, right? This is the hottest product right now on the market. And it's worth 50 bucks, you know, if you buy it in stores. And we're going to price our box at 50, but we'll give them a $10 discount. Anyone who loves Moroccan hair oil, and I was convinced, you know, I, I think this is like... I mean, what made you convinced about this Moroccan hair oil? Because it was so hot at the time, right? Like every single well, woman I like knew, well, this is 2013. Oh, okay. Well, so listeners like, can't see, but Danny has amazing hair. So yeah. So he, like, know, he, knows, yeah, yeah. he knows good hair. I, was like, I get, don't because I'm a like, yeah. get, get this Moroccan hair oil <laughs> and uh, we will sell out of these boxes, these 2,000. And we'll add other things in there. So we got the Moroccan hair oil. Then we got, you know, at the time... Uh, you know, we had a lot of friends at a company called Beachmint. Mike had spent some time there as well. Uh, and we got uh, the closeouts. We got <laughs> Beachmint's closeout products. So we got Beachmint's closeout products, uh, plus the Moroccan hair oil. And then we called a few of our other friends 
and said like, hey, we're looking for 2,000 units. We'll give you free advertising in our newsletter in exchange for the product. So that was the first 2,000 units. And by the way, it wasn't all closed out. There were some actually. Yeah, no, but the first, first, <laughs> first but it wasn't. Yeah, just was, for the record, yeah. there were some really top-notch dual there, there was some great. If you go look at yeah. that first box, it's still a great deal. Right, and obviously we've iterated and done a lot more on the sort of product development side and the merchandising side to get more and more value to the box today. But at the time, you know, compared to what was on the market, it was pretty good. And so, uh, you know, I guess where I was going with this is like the hiccups in the road. Like, so first box class action, second box, you know, uh, Rock and Herald. Well, no, first box was a class action and Rock and Herald. This oh, okay. Second box. You know, uh, had been working closely with a friend who said, "I'm going to get you the units for for your your box." And we had like what we had this notion of hero products, and we wanted to always have hero products that would sort of drive the sales. And so the first box we had the Rock and Herald. We we're looking for the second hero product. And uh, a week before, uh, my friend called and said, "You know what? The products are not going to be here on time." So I said, "What do you mean it's not going to be here on time?" She's like, "It's just not going to be here. I'm sorry." And you know. Today, if someone told me, hey, you need to go get 3,000 units of something, I would be like, okay, easy. I'll pick up the phone, call someone. People have 3,000 units in inventory. It should be a relatively simple process. Uh, then, you know, first, you know, we barely had the ability to pay for product. Uh, second, we, uh, we didn't even know that people had 3,000 units on hand. It was like sort of like surprising. So what happened was uh, we have another co-founder. Her name's Katie Kitchens. And uh, Katie had been on maternity leave. She went right after we launched the first box and she came back as we're about to, or right before we launched the first box and around that time. And she had came back as we're about to send out our second box. Katie came back to the office and she saw me just like lying on the couch. And like, you know, at this time I hadn't, I had been sleeping in the office a lot, like (laughs) was working 24 seven. It was just like not pretty. And uh, Katie's like, what's going on? I was like, honestly, Katie, I don't know what we're going to do. Like our main product fell out and I have no clue what's going to happen. And she goes, well, why don't I email my PR contacts and see if I can get us any products? I'm like, okay, like nothing to lose, right? And so Katie goes, uh, sends email to all her PR contacts, comes back maybe six or seven hours later. And she goes, damn, like not only did I get, I got three products, right? Not only did I get one, I got three. I was like, what do you mean you got three? She's like, okay. She's like, I got this, this, and this. I'm like, okay, do we have to pay for them? She goes, no, we don't have to pay for them. And I was like, great. <laughs> you know? I was I'm like, glad those other products right, are right, coming right. <laughs> well, It was like sort of funny. I was like, okay. I was like, you got three products, uh, this, that. I was like, okay, great. Like, Katie's like, uh, now the head of merchandising. And since that day, when she got those three products, she's overseen our merchandising efforts and like is still her responsibility. And so, so basically, you're getting all your products for free. And no, no, no. <laughs> now it's now it's now we're you know we're we're ordering note to vendors. Yeah. <laughs> yes, they're all free. <laughs> now we have so many people who are are vying for every single slot that like you know I just surmise that everyone is just going to be paying us to put products in the boxes I, in the future. Yeah, I, th- I think neither Danny nor I would describe anything as an overnight success. Yeah. I mean, I think, and there's. I mean, those I, mean are, I still I, th- I still think like you know you you. It's sort of the idea of taking nothing for granted. Like I think even still today, we're you know we're not not as paranoid as ever, but like you know we there's a lot more we want to do, and there's a lot of things we want to accomplish, and we still think it's still early early in our business, and you know the the bars obviously moved up a whole mm-hmm. lot, um, but you know I, I don't think you know by any stretch we think you know sort of we've we we're you know we've right. done it right, and I mean. As we kind of wind down this conversation, I'm curious as to, you know. That's it? I have so much more to say. Oh, oh trust no. me. Not, not, I said wind down. You know? um, I'm not done. Yeah. Um, but I'm just curious. Everybody has a different definition of success. You know, some are, you know, they want financial success because they just had never seen it growing up. Some want happiness. Some want a family. You know, for you two, you know, what is your definition of su- success both personally but also professionally uh, for this business? So I think, uh, and the answer may be different for Mike than it is for me. For me, it's like I have to feel like I'm constantly being challenged, constantly being pushed, constantly learning. And that's like sort of my like North Star of like, uh, am I feeling successful? Uh, and it's not, 
you know, it, it's not money, but I do like this notion of like having more people and employing people and sort of improving their lives by the function of the fact that they're working in an environment that, you know, I'm help help create or instrumental in creating. And so those are like the two things for me that define my success. Uh, so I'll split it up. I, I think there's what I, how I define success inside the business. Um, it, it, this is, I don't even know if this is the, the, how I define it, but what I'd say is it, it's sort of unfortunate. It, it, I, I almost think you can never say you're there. Right. <laughs> and, you know, it's something that I actually share with the teams is like, as soon as we accomplish a goal, that there's a there's another goal, right? right? And so I, I think, you know, that you, you have to find a way to be sort of happy within that, right? Because it, you you both want it, you want to still celebrate accomplishing things along the way. But you you know, every every single you know executive hire we've ever made, I you know, on their their you know, the first time I go on a walk with them or whatever, I tell them, you know, this is still the beginning, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Wherever we are, it's the beginning, right? And I think as as long if you don't have that attitude. Um, I think you stop. You sort of get complacent. You stop innovating, and I think you know when you stop innovating, you you know slowly. St- you're you're if you're not growing, you're sort of starting to die in some sense. And so I think whatever whatever goal we have, I think the bar moves higher. And I think so for business, and it, it, it jives really well with what Danny's saying, which is like it's always the next challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, I think on a more personal level, you know, and, and in some ways actually, this dives into the, what I you know what I think is special about FabFun. <sighs> Look, I, w- I want to be a happy person, right? And I want to, you know, do good things in the world, right? What, whatever that is. I think those are two th- sort of ideas that I c- come back to, which is, um, and a d- different point. And happiness is a complicated idea. It's, you know, there's 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 things that make you happy in the moment, and then there's things that, you know, you sort of have sort of delayed gratification and things, and in, you're investing into mm-hmm, your mm-hmm. sort of future happiness, um, and how to balance all those things that you know lead to, you know. There's better people than me to, to answer it, and or you know this is not the time or space. But great philosophers and psychologists have sort of commented along the way. Um, I, I think it dovetails really nicely with FabFitFun. I think there's some ser- serious magic about what we do, which is um, if you actually the, what I, mean, I say, I wouldn't dive into it, but I'll say at least say this much, which is if you actually study the research on happiness, there's three things that consistently show up in the literature as driving happiness. One is uh, the the quality of your relationships. Two is having a sense of meaning or purpose in your life. And three is actually novelty, um, like having new things or new experiences. And um, I think that third pillar is actually one that is easiest to forget about and easiest to ignore. Um, and I actually think what made, what's made us so special in our members' lives and we'll get the most insane letters. You won't believe the types of notes and letters. I mean, what's that, one of them that has like stood out to you guys? I mean, I'm gonna. Can I? I'll, I'll pull yeah, one up because I because I just for posted it. it. I just posted it in the team um, in our Slack, so it's go easy for, for it. me to for me to pull up, and I can fill up. You know, talking about pulling up as I pull it up, <laughs> uh, so there'll never be a, a moment's break in no, uh, fine. in this uh, in this podcast. But this is a post. It's in our community forms, um, and it was literally uh, three or four days ago. Uh, it's a member who said this box saved my life, uh, and they wrote. Uh, I I hope I have the courage to write this. I'm new to FFF, but this box has honestly saved my life. I have anxiety and depression, and I haven't left home in three years. I ended up being attacked by someone I knew and having his baby and grew very depressed. I have no friends, no family support, and the family that I do have lives across the country, so I barely see them. At one point, I was so alone that even my husband ignored me. I thought of taking my life because I felt I had nothing to look forward to. Then I saw an ad for FabFitFun and thought about trying it. My husband ended up getting it for me as a gift for Easter. Now I have something to look forward to, even if it's every few months, and I don't feel so alone because of this wonderful forum. FFF is seriously keeping me alive and helping my depression in ways I can't describe. My now two-year-old also loves seeing what we get. We love opening the box together. Thank you, FFF, for saving me. Now that's you know obviously that's heavy. That's yeah. a that's a that's the that's the extreme version of what we see, but we see you know other versions of that you know very very regularly, and people talking about you know whether it's depression or a death of a family member or some sort of chronic illness. And, you know, a lot of our members are just normal, happy people. And this is just, you know, you know, elevating them in some way. But I do think it's that idea of it's not just the products and it's not this sort of materialistic thing of like I'm getting physical things. It's the inspiration, right? Every three months, um, if you think of how you, 
you know, on how you feel on your birthday or how you feel on New Year's, you sort of become a little bit reflective. I think there's some version of that that happens at the change of seasons. It's just, that's nature, right? And um, we accentuate that. We remind people, hey, fall is coming, right? You know, people aren't thinking about it yet. It's, you know, just the beginning of August, but in a few weeks, you're starting to think, oh, summer's winding down. What's next and what's happening in fall and back to school and all these things. We put a, you know, sort of flag down and we say, hey, fall is here. Here's some inspiration. Here's some novelty in your life. Here's new things to get excited about, new ideas to, to get excited about. And we do that in a, and it's almost like a rebalancing because we're doing things for you from a beauty, fitness, fashion, wellness, health, you know, all these different perspectives. Um, and I think that's, you know, really what's at the core of what makes FabFun really special. Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I love that, especially that review of, you know, the product. I think it just goes to show that what, you know, you have both built here and obviously what you built here with the team is just more than a box with products in it. It's really, there's a higher purpose. And for every individual that gets that box, it, it might be a different purpose. So w with that, I think my question, you know, for both of you is, um, you know, where do you see FabFitFun being, you know, in the next five years and perhaps even beyond that and in, in your involvement with FabFitFun and, you know, what you guys have been doing here? Yeah, I think since day one, we've always viewed it as more than a box. And I don't know how much our, the listeners know about FabFitFun, but, uh, you know, we have this vision for what is a lifestyle membership. And so, Today, right now, it is already much more than a box. And so just to sort of list off the types of things that we're doing as part of our lifestyle membership, obviously, there's the box itself, which is highly personalized and curated. So we use a lot of sort of uh, things to create, you know, the nurses' box. Nurses', yeah, yeah. Your, it's, it's, it's okay, and Patrick's yeah. box and Michael's box and Daniel's box. And so uh, this is one big element of what we're doing is how do we sort of customize the shopping experience. And the ways we do that are, A, Customers are choosing products sometimes. Uh, the second is through sort of consumer insights and having deep understanding what's of what's a deep understanding of what's going to be trending. And the other is through like machine learning and algorithms and sort of leveraging data science, looking at product attributes and saying, hey, this type of product will resonate with this customer. So we have sort of that like sort of notion of a personal shop, shopping experience. Then from there, we have sort of these elements of things that go beyond the box. And so uh, what people don't know is, uh, you know, almost a third of our revenue comes from non-box uh, activities. So we have uh, private sales, whether they be products that you add to your box or sales that uh, happen outside of the box shipment. Uh, we have, uh, you know, other forms of the parts of the membership, including our premium uh, content, uh, FabFitFun TV, where you get access to uh, some of the latest workouts, some of the latest lifestyle content, some of the latest cooking content. Uh, you know, we're working on uh, basically more robust programming for FabFitFun TV. Uh, we have uh, a lot of exclusive and proprietary brands and products. So uh, one thing that people don't realize is we actually make a lot of the products that go in the box. And part of that is like sort of a supply chain magic that happens because when you're ordering, uh, you know, X number of units, a lot of companies that we partner with uh, don't necessarily have the ability to create that many units. So uh, we help them make that, but we also now partner with people and we launch products and brands. So, you know, when you look at that, you know, we have what is a lifestyle membership and often, you know, uh, I don't like to compare us to any other company because I always like to think the best companies uh, exist in a way that no other company has ever existed before. But, you know, I look at it as like Netflix for consumer goods. Mm -hmm. So when you look at like what Netflix did is they started with other people's sort of uh, premium content. And over time, they started bringing in their own hits. Like they have their own house of cards. Well, we have our own beauty brand called Ish, which stands for I'm Smoking Hot, uh, or our own lifestyle brand called Summer and Rose. And we think, you know, obviously content and physical products are very, very different, but we can take those products and brands and also build them in a, a way uh, that, you know, we look very much like a modern day CPG company. And one of the things that uh, that entails, and in the world we're living today, is niche, right? Like being niche. And what we're finding is that, like, not only do you want your own box of products, but you want this specific brand, and this person wants this specific brand. It's sort of when you drill down into it, uh, you know, everything that that is being successful. And if you look at like the, the the sort of consumer adoption of new brands, it's going very very fast to small boutique brands. And like, there's no one who really has the capability to house you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of brands under one umbrella. We think 
you know, we're sort of building the engine that allows us to do it. And the way you sort of tap into that world is through our lifestyle membership. Yeah. Uh, you want to add something? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I think, I, I think um, you know, D- Danny explained a lot of what we're thinking about. If I was going to give, you know, a, 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 another sort of hero company for both of us, um, it's, you know, in some sense, I, you know, company I just admire a lot through the ages and also started by a pair of brothers is Disney. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you think of Disney and what they do is they've actually built all of these sort of nodes and distribution places, right? They have everything from, you know, movie film distribution to theme parks to retail distribution and, you know, so on and so forth. And then the IP that they sort of put through that distribution is entertainment IP. It's Mickey Mouse, it's Star Wars, it's Marvel. um, And, you know, Historically, they've potentially partnered with it. Now, increasingly, they sort of buy those companies and own them. Um, but I think, you know, if, what I think is matchable at Fab Fun is um, we're we're doing something like what Disney does for entertainment IP, but for lifestyle IP. And how do I define lifestyle IP? Um, all these brands that are sort of helping you live, right, the best version of your life, whether it's fashion brands and how to be stylish or wellness brands and how to, you know, have a great meditation habit or whatever it is, right? All these sort of people and brands that are involved in that, Mm -hmm. the mixture of those people and the products they create, you know, I define as lifestyle IP. And what we want to do is create um, all these touch points where lifestyle IP can get, can come to life and to give its fullest expression. Um, And that's everything from the box to our FabFun TV platform to the community platform um, and many other platforms that we have in mind some of which we've already started working on and some of which I think are in, you know, the, in the decade long plan. And I think both Danny and I see multiple decades of plans ahead. So That's awesome. we'll be at this for a while. Yeah. Well, Daniel, Michael, it's, it's been such a great conversation. Uh, just kind of sitting here. I feel like we can sit here all day and talk to you guys, but I know you have stuff to do and, and got to go run a company. So um, you want to, did you want to add something? No, oh. just thank you guys. Oh yeah. 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 No, thanks yeah. so much for being on. Uh, couldn't agree more with kind of that feeling, you know, like of, of, uh, like you know, enlightenment every single month, just kind of getting something. So like you know, as a as a guy, like even like we're subscribed to Menlo Club. I don't know if you know them, but we're wearing their shirts and uh, shoes right now. And uh, nice, you we know, know those guys, Andreas for, and uh, D, D very D, well. Yeah, yeah. D was our first guest on the show. Um, and uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't. We didn't plan this. Yeah, we didn't plan it. But I mean, even as a guy, like you know, it's something that we so hopefully you guys like launch. A second company. You want to you want a Fab Fit we'll, men's box. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get to you eventually. Yeah, yeah, soon. That's that's kind of what I was trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of the whole point Very of doing cool. this podcast. Is not okay. Well, thanks so much, guys. Thanks and for, for the for the yeah. for the female listeners, uh, you know, maybe we, we your ten dollar off code will be founder. Love <laughs> for love it. Of the podcast. Let's do it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> thanks, thank, guys. Thank you guys for having us. Yeah. Thank you.